Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel for episode 14 of Bumbling Through Birthright. I got it right this time. Lots of things have changed. First of all, I don't have any hair anymore. I chopped it all off and I went to Florida. I've been a little bit ahead on my posting schedule, but I went to Florida for a week and so I'm now basically caught up to where we are in the actual sessions. And while I was away in Florida, Stjordvik went to war. So I missed it! How rude of them, invading a country without their foreign affairs minister. I did get a very brief update as to what happened, uh, so I can give that to you here. But, I mean, basically, victory! Yeah! With that though, let's just kind of get into what happened. If you're not sure how we got to this point on the cusp of war, or actually at war, make sure you check out the link below for the last episode, or you can always check out the playlist which has everything from the bumbling through birthright situation that we've got ourselves into here. But at the end of the last session that I attended, we were getting ready to figure out where we were going to send our troops. We decided to not only send troops up to Sarkol, which is the province in the north where the lady in the woods who we like is, and who was like having troops sent to attack her. No, we decided to split some troops to go to Sarkol and to also go to Iver, which is the de facto capital of the Bandit Kingdom. Technically, Vyborg is the actual capital, but the king's always in Iver, so Vyborg is an issue for another day. The player characters went down to Iver because it made the most sense because that was where the big baddie was, <laughs> and we did send up four units of troops to the north, and then they went down to the south with all the troops from Stjordvik. It was a siege. It wasn't a long siege but it was a siege. One of the major helpful factors was that Spinnick had some boats that they sent in for a naval blockade, so none of those longboats got out of port. And also the player characters kind of went around the back of the castle to make sure there was no secret way to get out, and they found one, and it didn't go well, but they <laughs> at least put some troops there so nobody could escape. After some people were sent out from the castle through that secret way and failed, the player characters, I believe that's how they got in, went in, came across Fulgar, and he had like some sorceress with him who could heal him. But they took him out in a very hard fought battle where I believe Rainier went down. Everybody else survived though, which is always a win, and usually more of us go down, so that was good. And then they took out his little sorceress pretty quickly thereafter. Up in Sarkhole, things went pretty well as well. Some of the units that had been sent up to help defend the province managed to pay off some of the bandit mercenaries that had been hired, and so they showed up to battle as if they were gonna fight, and then as soon as the opening shots of the battle happened, they just peaced out. And so they were able to take out the invaders pretty quickly. I believe a lot of them surrendered, so yay, country, banditry's not an issue anymore. Well, probably still is an issue, but not, you know. It could be worse. So that all happened while I was away, and then I came back for this session, and it basically starts out just after the siege, and the King of Spinnick is showing up with all his troops and all his cavalry and all that. He's got news that the fight in Sarkhole went amazing, victory, but there's no war here, which he was still expecting there to be a war here, because sieges don't typically last less, like, three days or less, so he showed up with his reinforcements way too late. He and Queen Brindis agree that they need to get, like, a committee together to figure out how much money there is in Spinnick and resources so that they can be evenly divided. While that's happening, a couple of our people need to take a long rest because they were hurting for more. Like, Roz just shows up, he's like, Hey, what's up? Your wizard's here! And there's nothing for him to do. And so away through the city of Iver they all go. Renolfer, who is from the Church of Eric, goes to Sarah's temple here to kind of see what's going on there, how they do religion, and they like him so much that he's like blessed with a little bit extra luck because Sarah is the goddess of luck 
And so I'm sure that will help him out later on down the road with his gambling problems. There's so many gambling problems. Brindis, meanwhile, decides to go out with King Ruthgar of Svinnick, and they wine and dine each other, and they just kind of talk about the situation, because they both want to unite the Highlands, so whatever happens here is going to be a good situation for both their countries, and for the two of them. Roz does what Roz does best, and he makes potions, and he sells them, because it's great. New country here? No, nobody... There, that dwarf, that stupid dwarf back in Holly Holman is not here messing with the market. Val roly polies into her usual of pit fighting and she makes her way all the way up to the top where she comes across the wolf who is the right hand man of King Ruthgar and they sprawl and Val wins and so it's like yes you're Vic Strong everybody there like all the fighters are super happy about that. And then Jan goes off as he tends to when we go into new cities to see if there's anything cool or exciting or unique worth buying. And he does find a lot of cool things, but they are so expensive, so he, he buys nothing. By the time we're done with all this long rest and doing our various things, the treasury has been counted. And we have not only the total of everything that's there, but we have a proposition from the, I guess, number crunchers of Svinnick as to what they think they should get. Well, Roz is on top of this being a wizard and probably good at math. Let's say he's good at math. And he is like, nope, you're shorting us 2.5 gold bars. This is, this is not going to happen. But before we really get into any other negotiation on that, King Ruthgar says, listen, I've got a different proposition that's not quite the same as what these number crunchers are pushing. And his suggestion is that Ruthgar and Brindis should marry and just unite all three countries under one banner. Now, if you remember from the last session, Brindis was getting proposals left, right, and center, and she, she, she did not want them, and it was hilarious. But she understands the value of this union, and so, you know, we go away, we discuss it, because, I mean, we don't want our queen to get pushed into a marriage just for the sake of it. And she decides that, no, this is the right thing to do, I want to unite the Highlands anyways, he's only a little bit older than me. Also re-rolled to see how attractive he was, and he got a 9 out of 10, so, like, might as well. So they decide to unite, they need a name for the country, they decide on Stjordvinik, and the court isn't just going to be in one place because like Iver makes the most sense but it's kind of a trash city. So instead of going to Hollingholmen or to Levika, which was the Svinnik capital, they're going to have a rotating court. So in summer and fall it's going to be in Levika, and then in winter and spring it'll be in Hollingholmen. Which makes sense because Hollingholmen is a little bit more south so the winter isn't as terrible. And who wants to be there in the winter anyway? So with that all sorted out, there's going to be a royal wedding at some point here. Don't know where. It's some, somewhere and sometime. But we decide that we should probably head back to Hollingholmen to start sorting this stuff out and just kind of, you know, figure out what's going on. Because we did go to war so there's a lot of stuff we need to do now that war is over. We decide to take one of the Ryuven longships, because like why not take a boat instead of walk, and we head back. And of course, as we're on our way back, there's pirates trying to get all up in our grill. I don't think they expected us to have a wizard or anybody with kind of long range on the boat. And so after a few choice fireballs and some lightning being pulled down by our druid, they were like, no, no, we surrender. So now we've got like some mariners that surrendered and another boat. Cool. Increasing the army already. We get back to Hollingholmen without any more difficulty after that. And once we show up there, Calder, who is one of Jans's associates, shows up. He's like, listen, I know of this high stakes gambling game that I think you might be interested in. And I know for a fact that Storm Holton is going to be there. And obviously Renolfer's like, oh, gambling, gambling, can I come? So <laughs> that's that's the next day. That's that's good. Yeah, that's going to be a fun one. Jan goes and checks in with Olaf about the goon pooter and the guns, and they're apparently going well. He's figured out how to make the goon pooter, but he needs more help making the barrel of the gun, so Jan promises once more to give him any money he needs for that. And then Renolfer actually has a thing that he needs to work on before he can go gambling crazily. I guess last session before they went to war, he found this book after he was giving a sermon at the church. I guess he rolled the complication and ends up finding this book that's like 
for summoning demons. <laughs> and so we need to figure out whose it was. There were three people sitting on the bench where he found it. So we need to go double check that these three people or which one of these three people is trying to summon a demon. He asks Roz to come because Roz is well versed in Arcana and has traveled a lot. And so Roz and Renolfer go off to the church and see what they can find. The first guy they check with, very quickly it becomes apparent to them that he is super illiterate and so off they go to find someone else. This guy's name is Theral and he is in the library so good chance he can read and he's got some acolytes around him and one of them is looking super sketchy like shifty like looking around like ah what's going on here and he excuses himself. We don't really get anywhere with Theral but we chase after this acolyte. <laughs> We aggressively medicine check him to make sure he's okay because, I don't know, it kind of seems like he's having an anxiety attack or something. Maybe it's because of us. He does, however, agree to speak to us somewhere that's not in the temple, so we take him to Three Trees Outpost because we know it's Jans's place and so we can get a place there where we can talk to this guy. And we go in and he says, yes, in fact, Theral is trying to summon this demon. The demon's name is Vaz Dinra. That is really hard to say and he wants to do this pretty quickly. He's quite repentant. He's like, oh my god, what am I doing? Summoning a demon is not the way to go. So he does tell us that he knows there is a ritual out there that can block the summoning of this demon, but he doesn't know what it is. So Roz kind of goes and starts researching that. Brindis is also doing some of her own research. So they're off researching that together. And it is the night of the high stakes gambling game. So Jan goes, of course, Renolfer was never a question, and Val decides to go as well to see if she can win. This is a huge high stakes, like it's 500 gold just to get in the door basically. And so Val is pretty quickly out because she doesn't want to go too, too far into this. Renolfer somehow puts himself up like two gold bars, that's 4,000 gold. And Jan and Storm Holton like go head to head. Storm is like, I'll bet you one of your holdings. And so they go head to head and Jan loses one of his holdings. But it's a holding that Jan didn't really like anyways. It's like some bakery way up in the north, so he's not too sad about it. Meanwhile, Roz and Brindis have had quite a bit of luck with the demon research because, you know, Brindis is giving Roz a hand when she can. And they have found a ritual that will summon a powerful planar being to get rid of this other demon, Vazdin Ra. I think I got it right that time. So what is there to do but go to Three Trees, because he's got a soundproof room there, Jan. Why do you have a soundproof room? I don't know. But we go there and we cast this ritual. Fortunately, our druid, Renolfer, it is his task after all, has cast a protective circle that will protect us against Fae, or against fiends, because the other ones, like, we're like, we can probably reason with those. And so we open the portal and out steps this giant fiend. And on his head, he's got a tiara. And across his chest, he has a sash that says, Mr. Abyssal. Mr. Abyssal existed before I played in the planar campaign that we did like a year and a half ago. Uh, but it was basically the way that the player characters had to give this really sticky situation was to have a demon or fiend beauty pageant. And this is the guy that won and he has been wearing this tiara and sash ever since. When I was playing in the planar campaign with them, even like months later, he would come up every once in a while. So this is this guy coming back to potentially haunt them or maybe help them. He's trying to win a blood war right now though, so who knows. But that was the end of that session. We have just opened up a portal. There is a fiend here and who knows how this is going to go. To find that out, make sure that you hit the subscribe button so you'll know when the next episode comes out and also, you know, hit the like button because fun things are coming. A fiend in a sash and a tiara? Come on, it's gonna be good. And with that, Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.